very special session tonight uh, with our featured guest speaker, Thomas Homer Dixon. My name is Chris Moore, uh, president of the APRM. Uh, before we get started, just a few brief words of thanks to some of the players that have contributed to this evening. Um, first off, he's not here. He, unfortunately, he's a little bit under the weather, but I want to acknowledge probably an indirect influence uh, in helping us get Mr. Homer Dixon here tonight. Um, it was largely through email and phone calls, but it, it worked. Um, second person I'd like to acknowledge as well, who, whoops, sorry. <laughs> um, she is not able to attend, but we are being video recorded. Her name is Noreen Dennis, and she is um, our go-to graphic artist who does all the artistic uh, notices, muse ads, posters, whatever we need. Um, next, um, Sherry Epp. Where's Councillor Epp? There she is. Um, Sherry has been working hard and actively to turn this into the venue that it's eventually becoming, not quite there yet. And uh, thank you, Sherry, for all your efforts there. Uh, Joshua is our, of the Mansfield, uh, the Shiloh Music Studio, who is um, our audiovisual man for the evening. Best part is that he has a studio here in this facility uh, called um, Shiloh Music. And if you have some aspiring musicians or recording artists, this is the guy to see. Uh, Leonard Farr, some of you know, Leonard was with us at the All Candidates meeting, did a fabulous job of the video recording at that time, and we've invited him back, and he's back there. We are going to be obviously recording this session uh, for those who cannot make it, and um, give us a couple of days to, to get it up. Um, I have to acknowledge the Machosan Muse team. We had some real challenges at about five minutes to midnight, meeting press deadlines. Uh, it was quite a bit uncertain right up to the last hour. And I must say that they, um, they were flexible and did it with amazing grace. The uh, last but not least is Chief Stephanie Dunlop and our fire department volunteers who hand moved all of these chairs from various locations in Machosan today and are on site making sure that we conduct this in a safe and reasonable way. So uh, that said, before I formally uh, introduce our speaker, Thomas, but it, Tad, as he prefers to be known, I'd like to give you a brief overview of this evening's session. Um, the first part of the evening, up till about eight o'clock, I understand Tad is on a red-eye flight to Toronto from here. Um, that's tonight. And um, once that part is over, we'll take a 10-minute break uh, to allow attendees who do, do not wish to stay for the AGM, you'll have an opportunity to leave uh, should you choose to do so. Um, upon return, we will proceed with our annual general meeting, which happens to be overdue by a year. So it's going to be a little retrospective, but has to be done. Um, the APRM executive is under absolutely no illusion as to why most of you are here tonight, and we completely understand. Um, as a short introduction to our speaker, I'd like to take the liberty, for those of you who do not already know, a bit of the background of our honored guest. Uh, 
Tad is one of Canada's leading scholars on complexity science, human conflict, and threats to global security. His academic background is impressive and diverse. Uh, a BA in political science from Carleton, PhD from MIT, on to the University of Toronto with full professor status um, in 2006, followed by an appointment as research chair at the Un University of Waterloo as international governance chair of global systems. And as far as I can recall, there was also a stint at Harvard. Uh, more recently, Tad became executive director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University, a cross-disciplinary network that he founded in 2020. A renowned author of The Integrity Gap, Governor General award-winning nonfiction, The Upside of Down, and more recently, Commanding Hope. He gives his audience a heck of a lot to think about. Um, I'm personally struck by the quote, we are victims of very rapid change, and thereby the psychological necessity of hope. Um, I doubt that there are a few in this audience who could not relate to that. Um, and on top of this, Cat is one of us. I'm a chosen resident, and it doesn't get better. <laughs> Over to you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Ooh, I'm loud. Let me stand out of the light. Uh, just move this. It's really marvelous to be here. Uh, this is a very special evening for me, and I see lots of friends and folks I know from a chosen here in the audience, but I'm looking forward to getting to know most, if not all of you, over the next while. So I want to give you a little bit of history of my family in Machosan and how we came to be here before I start to talk about uh, the work that we're doing at the Cascade Institute, especially as it relates to hope in the polycrisis. I'll talk about what the polycrisis is, and I'll talk about some of my arguments about hope in my, rate, my most recent book. Um, so let me say just a little bit about, about us here in Machosan. Maybe we can have the first slide, Sasha. So uh, that's a view that we're all very familiar with here. I show this to people around the world and they go, whoa. But that's the view from uh, our property. That's actually where I write my books in a little cabin uh, on uh, Perry, the end of Perry Crossroad, looking over Taylor Beach. And uh, if you turn around, you look at the house, go to the next slide, uh, it looks charming. So uh, my father bought this in 1976. Uh, and you know, in those days, it was like, if everybody said, why are you moving out there, right? And it, it really does look charming uh, until you take a really good look at it. There are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things that hide sort of underlying inadequacies, let's put it that way. So it was just, this is 2016, it had just been painted. Let's uh, go to the next slide. So that is the original wing of the house, uh, built in, I think, 1920 by a Colonel Osborne. Uh, I think he'd just come back from the First World War. He probably had post-traumatic stress syndrome, and he wanted to go and live in the woods somewhere and be a long way away from people. And it was basically a cabin in the woods. In fact, those footings there weren't part of the original building. Next slide. If you go underneath, that's what it looks like. I expect that this is pretty common for a number of the older residences in, uh, in Machosan. So those are round sitting on flagstones or on dirt. And then go to the next slide. That's my uh, Swiss Army knife, giving you an indication of the state of the logs, right? So we're in the process of actually ripping that end of the house down right now in a massive renovation. We're not living in the property right now. Uh, massive renovation. Next slide. 
And those are uh, Sarah and my kids. That's Ben on the left, who's 18, and Kate on the right, who's 14. They just, uh, she's 15, actually. So they, they just had their birthdays. Uh, but you can see we've completely gutted the interior. It was full of asbestos. It was everything that you can imagine. Is, and of course, anytime you start, whoa. But well, you can leave it there. It's a good place to leave it. Uh, anytime you start something like this, you're immediately into codes and you're, you immediately have to bring everything up to code. And uh, well, don't get me going on code. <laughs> anyway, so we've been here, my dad bought this in 76. The family has been here for pretty close to 50 years now. So I think that makes us almost old timers, but my dad lived here and hardly anybody knew him. It was really interesting. Hardly anybody knew that he was a member of the community for all that period. He was the chief forester for the Greater Victoria Water District. During his career, he retired, I think it was in 95, passed away in 2015. We had to decide whether we were going to keep the property. And ultimately, uh, we decided to move from Ontario. I'd been out there for 40 years. We both, both Sarah and I had uh, uh, faculty positions at the University of Waterloo. We basically took a sledgehammer to our lives in, in Ontario and moved out here. And thank you very much to Royal Roads University. Uh, we we uh, have positions there now and uh, we're welcomed with open arms and given an opportunity to create this new institute, the Cascade Institute. Sarah's not involved with that, but I'm involved. I'll tell you a little bit about it later. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so it's wonderful to be here as full members of the community. For a period of 40 years after my dad bought the property, I was here maybe three, four times a year, uh, but never really a member of the community. And now I, I, I feel we really are and deeply invested in the well-being of this community uh, and, and working with all of you to try to make sure that we, we preserve and protect what we have here, which is so extraordinary so, um, but it's part of what I want to emphasize is the contrast between this this kind of blessed life this kind of peaceful remarkable beautiful natural surroundings we have here and what's happening in the rest of the world some of which spills over into our world with heat domes and smoke from forest fires and things like that sort of intrudes on us and you think about what has happened in our world in the last five years or seven years or so. Next slide. The world really does seem to be going haywire. And this is where this concept of the poly crisis comes from, which I'll unpack for a few minutes. And I'll just go through a bunch of images. And I should say, trigger warning, I got my knuckles wrapped the other day because I did a presentation at a Victoria Independent School. And some of the parents were a little bit upset afterwards about me generating too much anxiety among the students. So uh, some of the stuff I'm going to say is hard. Interestingly enough, and I see my friend Werner over there, who's, that is Werner behind the mask, isn't it? Hi, Werner. <laughs> With, uh, whom I share, Werner Kurtz, uh, one of the world's leading authorities on carbon, forest carbon modeling, share a lot of conversations about climate science. I pulled out, before this presentation that I did in town, I pulled out a lot of the stuff I'm going to show tonight because it's just too, I knew it was too hard for the kids. I will give you a sense of advance warning. But there is a trajectory to this talk. There will be an emotional nadir, I'll tell you when we get there, and then, you know, we'll take it beyond that and, and uh, take it to a place where I think we can at least see some possibility for a positive future. Um, but where are we right now? Next slide. I mean, poof, just before my dad passed away in 2015, uh, he was still completely lucid, so about three weeks before, four weeks before, it was the first big smoke episode. We probably all remember it. The smoke came across the sky like a scythe. It was uh, beginning of July, I think July 8th. And uh, I asked dad, and he was 89. He'd been in, working in the woods for 70 years. I said, have you ever seen anything like this before? And he said, no. This is new, right? We've had five, I think five major summer smoke events since 2015. So there's something definitely new is happening. So, and so much of the West, Western regions of North America are on fire in the summer. Fires in Siberia, fires in Australia, uh, fires in Brazil. Next slide. And then of course the 
pandemic, a pandemic which was a shock that hit the world, that really put humankind on a radically different trajectory. Not entirely clear that it's for the worse, which I'll come to towards the end of my presentation, uh, but certainly uh, changed everything. And we're living with repercussions on a daily basis now. This bankruptcy of Silicon Valley Bank in California is directly related to the economic policies that emerged from the, from the, uh, from the, the pandemic. Massive flood of liquidity into the economy, produced inflation, forced interest rates up, and the interest rate shock undermined the financial viability of Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, we're on a different pathway, still le leading with, le living with the repercussions and will be for many, many years. Next slide. Uh, enormous unrest, especially in Western societies, over structural imbalances of wealth and power and opportunity within our societies, systemic racism. Next slide. Uh, mass migrations of people around the world, according to the United Nations, the largest migrations humankind has seen outside of major wars, such as the First and Second World War last, last century. Next slide. Uh, and in BC, I mean, it's like, it's like we're in the crosshairs, in fate's crosshairs in this province. One thing happening another. I, you know, I had a slide here of Lytton after the heat dome, after the fire, and then, yeah, but I thought there was too much from BC, so I took it out. And of course, this is the consequence of the uh, atmospheric rivers in the fall of 2021. Next slide. A war, major war in Eastern Europe, which I would argue is really a fundamental contest between radically divergent political ideologies and political systems uh, of a hu huge consequence for the world. Uh, and, but it does have a, a real prospect of escalation beyond this, the region in Eastern Europe to potentially something catastrophic for the world. And it's destabilizing geopolitics in such a way around the world that uh, it, may, it may induce conflicts elsewhere. It might encourage, there's some arguments that you could say that this, this conflict is destabilizing things so much that it encourages, for instance, China to in invade Taiwan. We can talk a little bit about that later. Next slide. Climate change. Climate change keeps coming back up to the top of the agenda. It's like, it's like the, the first among equals problem in the poly crisis. Next slide. And here, Pakistan, a third of the country underwater last summer. So this is a pretty miserable litany of stuff. Next slide. And um, it's become called increasingly in sort of policymaking circles a polycrisis, which basically means a lot of bad stuff happening simultaneously. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's a good term. Um, People sort of think of it as a perfect storm, a whole bunch of things happening, and maybe if we just wait, things will get better. The problem with this idea of it being a perfect storm is it makes it sound like it's a coincidence that everything, that all these bad things are happening together. I think, unfortunately, and this is what we're researching within the Cascade Institute, it's actually the case that these things are connected causally, and that they're reinforcing relationships between climate change, pandemic, economic instability, declining democratic authority, weakening inst democratic institutions, mass migrations, that these things are all connected, not all of them, and in, in many cases we can't see the connections very well because we haven't done the research effectively yet, and when I say we, I mean world scholars and academics, but there's, a, uh, there's reason to believe that there, it's not just a coincidence that there are causal mechanisms driving a lot of these systems across thresholds simultaneously in a bad direction. That's what we mean by the poly crisis, that these risks of climate and collapsing biodiversity, climate change, collapsing biodiversity, widening economic inequalities, rising political authoritarianism, you can have, there's a list of 20 or 30 things that people come up with, uh, that they are, uh, they are uh, amplifying in severity, accelerating in rate, and synchronizing in the crises they generate. Amplifying, accelerating, and synchronizing. So that's the basic hypothesis that we are investigating at the Cascade Institute. And that's actually what I'll be talking about in Ottawa the day after tomorrow when I, when I uh, 
when I go there. So, um, next slide. This is a pretty nasty emotional environment. It, you could say that if we continue down this tra trajectory, this will be a century that is dominated by the emotion of fear, right? And fear becomes, next slide, anger. And there are people out there, next slide, who take advantage of that to build their political power and divide us from each other so we actually are worse at solving our problems rather than better at solving our problems. And this is not just something that's happening outside the Canadian polity. Next slide. We've seen these divisions manifest themselves in Canada. And Werner, I'm very sorry, I'm gonna to have to refer to you again, but, but uh, I think, Werner, you, you were saying that during the convoy on Vancouver Island, you were going up island and you started uh, seeing the trucks as you pulled out of Langford, about the Langford Parkway, and they, there was a line of trucks all the way over the Malhat, all the way to Mill Street. There is a profound socioeconomic divide between the southern part of this island and the northern part of this island. That is a manifestation of a lot of the problems that we're facing in Canada and uh, in Western societies in terms of widening, widening economic inequalities, increasing insecurity, economic insecurity, uh, anger at political elites and technocratic elites, the delegitimization, the loss of moral authority of institutions. This is all, this is happening right here in our backyard, just as it was happening at the same time across the country. So uh, where do we go? What do we do about this? But next slide. So practically, we need to address this combination of problems in two ways. The first, next slide, is that we actually have to go after the things that are causing the problems in the first place. We know this. We need to get carbon dioxide emissions down a lot, as I will argue in a moment, way more than we're doing right now. We need to address the drivers of economic inequality and insecurity. We need to uh, be much more conscious of addressing and dealing with systemic racism. And social media, it's just corrosive. Uh, and we see it operating within the communities of our children right at the moment, trying to pull them away from, from their screens, from their engagement with social media. Uh, just engines of status anxiety, constantly pumping up people's status anxiety. Uh, and, and that encourages people to do a lot of things to build their status within their protective, particular groups that aren't very often very constructive for the broader society, deepen social divisions. We know a lot about what we need to do on each one of these. We are doing some things. We're not doing enough in most cases. We're not effectively addressing those connections that are linking these problems together in ways that are causing them to synchronize. Uh, I don't think that that's impossible. We just haven't, and part of the problem is that we, in our scientific institutions, in our universities, and in our government institutions, we silo these problems. We have something on climate change and emergency management. The Premier just set up a new ministry of, what is it? Climate readiness and emergency management. I think it is great, very, very important. And then there's, you know, there's an, there are two or three ministries that deal with climate, and there's one on, you know, there's one on health, and there's one on, that deals with housing and homelessness. And, but the problem is that these problems cross all these boundaries, and we're not very good yet at addressing these spillover effects, getting people in these different silos, whether they are scientific disciplines or institutions or government ministries to talk to each other, solve their problems. But we still, we have a sense for what we need to do. Next slide. But we also need to work at the same time on the psychological impact because it's overwhelming, it's devastating for people. And maybe I should have had my knuckles wrapped, you know? It's very hard to know when I go in front of an audience how I should, and you'll see it gets more difficult in a minute, how I should talk about this stuff. How do we talk to our kids and our grandkids about this stuff? I, I, I wrote a whole book, as you'll see in a moment, asking that question. 
think I might be just beginning to see an answer. 100,000 words later, right? It's really, really hard. But the core of it, I would argue, is, next slide, hope. If we lose hope, we're toast, right? Then, then we don't have any motivation to try. And wow, when, the, when our children or your children or your grandchildren say, this is looking really bad, I don't know what my life is going to be like in the future, what's the first thing you do? You say, well, there's still a possibility that it's going to be okay. There are these things you can do to make it better. We reach for hope. It's the first tool we reach for in our emotional toolkit. The problem is hope has kind of a bad rap. Next slide. And I spend a whole book, as I said, trying to tell the story of hope for Ben and Kate and for other children. What, what, are, the, what are the arguments that we can build to rationally defend hope? How can we think about hope? What kind of idea of hope are we going to, are we going to use in the future? Hope is a, is a plastic emotion. We can define it in different ways. The, the title commanding hope is a, intentionally a double entendre. It, hope is an emotion we can command. We can, we can actually reform it, innovate with it, make it new, make it a, a different kind of hope from the, from the kind of hope that people are using in their everyday lives. And if we're successful in generating this new, more powerful notion of hope, then it will command our attention. So it's reciprocal. Next slide. And as I said, they're the kids uh, back in 2012. That's when I started writing the book. It was the hardest one I've ever written. It took me eight years to write. And, uh, uh, and very much motivated by my sense of what am I going to tell Ben and Kate? What are Sarah and I going to tell Ben and Kate when they start to realize what's going on in this world? Right? Next slide. So hope, I think, as I'm arguing, is essential for our psychological and social resilience. And if we're to solve our problems, it's a starting point. It's not the only thing, but it's, you know, to use a Latin phrase, it's a sine qua non. It's a necessary condition for everything else, okay? But it's really complex. Next slide. And it tends, it, it, it tends to have a bad rap because the kinds of hope that we use in the world, according to his critics, and there are a lot of them out there, a lot of people who think we should just give up on hope because hope is false, naive, or passive. It's false. False hope means that it, it leads us to believe that certain things are more probable, certain good outcomes or possibilities are more probable than they actually are. It's naive because frequently it doesn't come with any kind of idea of how we get from where we are now to the world we hope for. There's no pathway, right, realistic or, or uh, empirically grounded pathway, pathway grounded in empirical evidence and evidence for how we get from where we are to where we want to go. And it's passive uh, because it sort of sits back and says, I just hope that the world will get better. I hope that the world will get better. It's not, I hope to make the world better. The kind of hope I talk about in Commanding Hope is an active, muscular hope. It's a hope to kind of hope, not a hope that kind of hope. So I, and I'm not going to go through all of this this evening, but I contrast each one of these, or I respond to each one of these criticisms by proposing honest hope instead of false hope, astute hope, instead of naive hope, and powerful hope instead of passive hope. Honest hope, grounded in scientific understanding, a very clear understanding of the seriousness of our problems. You take away all the denial, all the sugarcoating, and you just look it right in the face, right? Uh, astute hope, a very, it's, it's informed by an understanding of how we get from where we are to where we want to go, especially how we work with people who don't think like us to build the alliances and the coalitions, and, the, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, the, the agreements socially among us that will allow us to get where we want to go, to get that better world. And then powerful hope, powerful hope is a hope that has a vision of the future, that has a sense for what it is we want, so it has a sense for where to aim, right? And those are the three components of what I call commanding hope. I'm gonna talk a little bit about each, of, about the first and the third uh, over the next few minutes. 
Next slide. So let's talk about hope and honesty. There's a really deep tension between hope and honesty, and I think we all feel it. And this is partly what was going on when I got my knuckles wrapped, right? Because I was just a bit too honest with these kids. Even though I pulled a lot of stuff out, it was like, oh, you know, I, I probably should have had a trigger warning of some kind at the beginning of the presentation. And yet, these are kids of 16, 17, and 18 know when we are not telling them the full story. They know when we're lying to them or holding back stuff. They know they're smart, right? They get all this information. They may get worse misinformation of various kinds from their online sources. So I don't actually know if we're doing them any favors by not, by hiding things from them. Next slide. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to deliver some inconvenient truths, but most of us, at least all of us, all of us want to believe the reassuring lie, and sometimes we do. All of us, right? We say, okay, it's going to be okay, right? Even when we don't have clear evidence that it is going to be okay because we haven't solved these problems yet. And that's fine, but you have to return to that, that inconvenient truth regularly and just ground yourself in what's really going on. Next slide. One of the ways that on uh, climate issue, uh, we're, we're being comforted by a reassuring lie right at the moment, and this is a tough. And I don't think David Wallace Wells would like what I'm going to say very much. Maybe at some point I'll have a chance to have an exchange with him about it. He's a, a, a journalist for the New York Times. He's written some really hard-hitting stuff on climate change, on the implications of climate change. Clearly, there was a lot of pushback. Because he's come back and said, gee, you know, it turns out it's not going to be as bad as we thought. We're not going to go to four degrees. We're only going to go maybe to 2.5 degrees over pre-industrial temperatures. We're at 1.2 right now, right? Well, maybe, maybe we'll be somewhere between 2 and 2.5 because the price of renewable power is coming down so fast. Uh, photovoltaic electricity, solar, and uh, wind power in particular. And so the world is changing technologically. And so a lot of the pathways for release of carbon dioxide involve huge consumption of coal in the forward, in the future, are no longer realistic. So we're not going to go to four degrees. Hooray, we're going to go only to 2.5. Well, first of all, I'd say, as a specialist in the implications of environmental stress for social stability, which is something I've studied for decades, 2.5 degrees is incompatible with anything like liberal democracy. It's probably incompatible with, with any, uh, uh, any coherent global order. It's going to be very hard to feed 10 billion people at 2.5 degrees. And when you start to run out of food in societies, things start to fall apart, right? So I think 2.5 is a catastrophe. We, look, we seem to be getting things that are approaching catastrophe, and there's a real possibility of simultaneous breadbasket failures, two or three different places on the planet that are producing a lot of planet's food, going into drought conditions simultaneously, even at 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 degrees. 2.5 is going to be okay? Okay, so that's my first critique. The second is that he's probably wrong. That according to some of the latest science I've been reading, four degrees seems to be in the cards. So this is the emotional nadir of this presentation, okay? This is the trigger warning for this point. Next slide. So just a few quick things on what's happening in terms of climate change. The, these, this, this is the Keeling curve, which is the curve of carbon dioxide, increase in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, in the, in the Earth. It has this kind of sod. This is a, a observatory in Hawaii, Mauna Loa. And it has a kind of sawtooth edge to it because there's a cycle of carbon dioxide concentrations through the year. You get release of carbon dioxide in the northern hemisphere during the fall and the winter as vegetative matter decays, and then it gets, gets absorbed from the atmosphere during photosynthetic processes in spring, right? So it goes up and down, but you can see a pretty steady increase there. It looks kind of like an exponential curve. And the important thing to note about this is that we actually had a downturn, a significant downturn in carbon dioxide emissions during the pandemic in 
2020. Can you see it? We have so far to go, not just to get this curve down, which is where we ultimately want to turn it around and start to drop the concentrations in the atmosphere. We, want, we, we have so far to go to even begin to bend the slope so it's not increasing so fast. Next slide. And this is where we're going in terms of warming if we continue on the current trajectory. We have, going back in temperatures to 11,300 years before the present, that's to the end of the last ice age, so this is what's called the Holocene epoch since the end of the last ice age, to, to the present, you can see it's normalized to zero degrees Celsius. Surface temperature of the planet is normalized to the average temperature between 61 and 90. It's actually 13.6 degrees Celsius averaged across the surface of the entire planet, but we'll just call it zero. And, and you can see that during this 11,000 odd years, the total variance of temperature on the planet was around 0 0.7 degrees. In the last 2,000 years before the present, is around 0 0.5 degrees. Remarkably stable climate period during which human civilization flourished. We laid down the infrastructure of modern human, human civilization, the port systems, the roads, the major cities, the agricultural zones, irrigation systems and the like. And we're already outside that envelope. We're already in a place where, where uh, the rules are very different from ever before in human, human civilization. Uh, and in geological time, things are changing so fast, this is geological time across the bottom, very compressed time scale, it's like instantaneous change in the concentration of carbon dioxide and the temperature of the planet, right? That's a slide I didn't show the kids, but it's in my book, next slide. And this is something I really didn't show the kids. And I don't know, Bernard, if you've seen this. Did I send this to you? I can't remember. Yeah. So this is James Hansen. James Hansen is the world's most famous climate scientist. Okay. And uh, he's retired. He was NASA's senior climate scientist at NASA Goddard for many, many decades. He was the one who went in front of Congress in 1998 at Al Gore's behest and said, climate change is here. We're seeing the signal emerge from the no weather, noise of weather. So he released this paper with his research team in December, and it basically says that we already have, to use a technical term, the radiative forcing, which basically means the amount of radiation coming in that's being trapped on the surface of the planet, not going back out to space, that's equivalent to a doubling of CO2, right? Even though we aren't at a doubling of CO2 in terms of the actual measurements yet, we're still about 100 and 40 parts per million short. We're already there in terms of radiative forcing, which locks in four degrees with feedbacks, which basically means things like Arctic ice melting, ocean warms, makes the atmosphere over the Arctic warmer, more ice melts, that's a feedback. There are a whole bunch of those feedback processes in, in the climate system. And with feedbacks, we. Uh, in the short to medium term, we get to four degrees. In the longer term, with the carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere now, we get to 10, 10 degrees. That's it for human civilization, right? So I sent this paper to a colleague of mine that I went to MIT with back in the 1980s. So he's a climate scientist down in Australia, a senior climate scientist. And I said, no leading question. I said, what do you think of this? And he wrote back and he said, well, <clears throat> I'm not completely able to assess all the science, but I do know that Hansen is consistently ahead of the curve in his assessment of the science, that he turns out to be right and people sort of catch up to him a decade later. Uh, and that, uh, well, James said some relatively disparaging things about the climate scientists in the IPCC process, let's put it that way, that they are, they are, uh, extraordinarily conservative in their assessment and really scared of, of alarming people too much about the climate problem. So they're not really telling the whole story about how serious it is. Okay, so that's the emotional nadir. I think about this paper a lot. I didn't talk to the kids about it. It's really scary, right? 
Wallace Wells and Roger Palkey and the others who are saying, well, it's going to be okay. We're not going to burn all the coal. We're, all go we're, we're going to keep it to 2, 2.5 degrees are forgetting about the feedbacks in the system. And they're what drive this, this process to much higher temperatures, ultimately. Next slide. Okay, a little, little bit more of the emotional nature. We're sort of skipping along the bottom here. Uh, the, pro the problem is these climate systems are really linked together. And what climate scientists are realizing now is that if you, if you cause too much damage or instability in one component of the climate system, it could, it could cause a series of instabilities or flips, tipping points and others. And, uh, and this is becoming a quite uh, prominent element of current climate science research. Next slide. And here's uh, a slide representing some of the different possible linkages between tipping phenomena. So let's say we get Arctic sea ice reduction. You see at the top there, the little bullet bullseye up the top. It affects uh, circulation in the Atlantic, and that can affect droughts in the Amazon, but also accelerating ice, ice loss in the West Antarctic ice sheet. These things turn out to be connected. They call them teleconnections, so like causal relationships between them. And the concern is that if one flips, like we get a, a shift in Arctic sea ice, it could cause a cascade of other systems to flip within a relatively short period of time, decades. So we have a really serious problem, and I don't know if there's a way out at this stage. And I've been working on this stuff as Werner has for decades. Next slide. The fundamental challenge is that we face what I call in the book an enough versus feasible dilemma. So on one hand, changes that would be enough to make a real difference to keep us to 1.5 or 2 degrees aren't economically, socially, politically, or technologically feasible. And yet on the other hand, those that are feasible that we can do won't be enough. Next slide. Two degrees, for instance, is uh, supposedly our target is 1.5, but 1.5 is gone. We're not going to make 1.5. Probably not going to make two degrees. If you look at most of the models for two degrees, how we cap warming at two degrees in the world, they involve using technologies to suck enormous amounts of carbon dioxide of the, out of the atmosphere and pump it underground. So something called bioenergy carbon capture and storage, B-E-C-C-S, BEX. Something like 90%, Werner can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's something like 90% of the models in the latest IPCC report that kept us to, of the model runs that kept us to uh, uh, two degrees Celsius involved extraction of tens of billions of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, pumping it underground, this is projections into the future. We're going to build this technology. We're going to disseminate it all over the world. Huge plants and huge areas of the planet covered with fast-growing trees that we're going to burn, generate power, and then take the carbon dioxide from those that burning and pump it underground. And that's going to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We aren't even doing this on a tiny scale, let alone a global scale. So that's the kind of lie we're telling ourselves right now, right? It's not... That would be enough, maybe, but it doesn't look feasible. Next slide. So this cartoon sort of captures it. So apparently changing to energy efficient light bulbs wasn't enough. You know, we're doing it all in our own lives. You know, we're, we're trying to recycle, we're using, we're, we're putting, packing insulation into the walls of our houses, we're, we're uh, buying electric vehicles. You know, m most of us are trying to be really conscientious about this, but it's not getting us to enough. Next slide. It's like the two, if you think of this in a Venn diagram terms, if all the possible solutions to the climate problem, there's a whole bunch that are neither enough nor feasible. There's some that are enough but not feasible. And there's some that are feasible but are not enough. Next slide. We need to find some stuff that's both enough and feasible. And that's part of what the Cascade Institute is trying to do right now. It's trying to find if there's any zone there where the solutions that are enough overlaps with the solution, solutions that are feasible. Next slide. So let me talk. So remember I, I said we, we have to do two things. We have to address the, the material drivers and then the psychological implications. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, over the next, last part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about 
one idea for addressing some of these material drivers of the poly crisis, in particular of climate change. And then I'm going to talk about um, the, an approach to dealing with the psychological implications. Uh, <clears throat> so right now we're working on this hope and honesty thing. We're being really honest about the seriousness of the problem. And we need a, an approach to solving a climate problem that's as big as the problem. This is Manhattan Project level. Massive social investment. Not fiddling around at the edges with a little bit of carbon tax here and there, right? So, and what might it involve? Well, climate change is mainly a problem for providing a huge quantities of high power density zero carbon energy. And I'll explain what I mean by power density. It basically means watts per square meter. Okay, next slide. So the problem with wind and solar, which people like David Wallace Wells don't seem to understand, is that you don't generate a lot of watts per square meter. Wind power, if you're lucky, gives you three watts per square meter, five, something like that. You have to space the turbines far enough apart that they don't interfere with each other's wind streams. Solar in these big arrays might give you 40 watts per square meter, right? A, a tower in downtown Toronto, say the TD Center in downtown Toronto, will be consuming thousands of watts, up to 5,000 watts per square meter. There's this fundamental mismatch between the power density of production of systems like this and the power density of consumption of our societies, especially our urban areas and manufacturing facilities like aluminum smelters and, and the like, right? Enormous quantities of power have to, be, have to be pushed into our high complexity societies. And we're gonna cover wide swaths of territory with these things. You're already seeing rural rebellion against this across the United States. I think it's, I was reading the other day, it was Northern Norway or Sweden, the Sami are opposing a massive wind farm and, and, and environmentalists are on the, on the side of the, of the indigenous folks, right? This is not, it may be a stopgap measure, but it's, this is not the solution to our climate problem. Next slide. And, and just to give you a little technical stuff, here we have power density in watts per square meter on the left-hand side. It's a logarithmic scale from zero to 10,000, right? So it increases really fast. There are a bunch of different energy sources across the bottom. The conventional ones that we use are on the left-hand side there. Gas heating, gas electricity, oil, coal heating, nuclear, coal electricity. Next slide. Where we want to go are these slides, excuse me, are these power uh, sources in the left, in the right-hand circle, solar PV, wind, those are the two big ones. Notice their power densities are on down around 10 watts per square meter. The problem with petroleum, it's, it's a wickedly good energy source, right? It, you have a power density with a petroleum well in the thousands of watts per square meter. A power density of a nuclear plant is in the thousands of watts per square meter. The, the, it, there's a reason we built these incredibly complex energy hungry societies around these technologies. And now we're being told we can't use them. Just to give you a sense for slightly different concept, the energy density of petroleum. Every time you fill your gas tank, if you still have an ICE, uh, fill your gas tank with a tank of gasoline, you're putting two years of manual labor, physical labor in that gas tank. Two tablespoons of gasoline actually two tablespoons of crude oil contain as much free energy as would be expended by an adult male laborer in a day. It's wickedly good stuff. We can't sustain the kind of societies that we've created without something that's comparable. So what's it going to be? Next slide. Well, it's not, I don't think it's going to be small modular nuclear reactors, which is all the rage right now. Because it turns out that these SMRs have a waste disposal problem that's worse than the big nuclear reactors. We can talk about that. I, I think we use everything. We use solar, we use wind, we use nuclear. We got to put everything into the mix right now to get through the next few decades. But ultimately, nuclear on the surface of the planet is not going to be a, a good solution for us because it produces a lot of waste that we have to figure out how to dispose of and we haven't done a very good job of that. Next slide. I didn't point out that high temperature geothermal, I think, I would argue is in the wrong place. It's actually potentially a high power density source. So that's, 
when I talk to Ben and Kate about what, what's the enough versus feasible way of dealing with our energy problem to deal with the climate problem, I talk about ultra-deep geothermal, and that's what the Cascade Institute is researching right now. It's one of the things I'm going to be talking about in Ontario. Next slide. So this is where you go down into the earth, you go deep, you pump fluid down there, you heat up the fluid, bring it up to the surface and use it to drive turbines. If you go deep enough, you can get really hot rock, three, 400 degrees Celsius. The problem is we don't, aren't actually very good at drilling really deep. Next slide. These guys, GA Drilling, which is a Slovakian company, are sort of indicating that you, you, know, you get down over 10 kilometers and you're starting to get into really high temperatures. Uh, the problem is the drilling, and I used to be a driller, or I used to work on the oil, in the oil patch, help put myself through university, working on oil rigs and stuff, oil and gas rigs in Alberta and BC. Those, those drilling technologies that we see you know, with the coned bits with the, the teeth on them, are designed for uh, sedimentary rock, soft rock. And we can go up to 10 kilometers through soft rock, but we can't drill through igneous rock and metamorphic rock, which is hundreds to thousands of times harder than sedimentary rock. And that's the major technological challenge. It's about drilling fast, cheaply, deeply through hard rock. You go around the world, next slide, and this is our argument in the Cascade Institute. You go around the world, you talk to drillers all over the world, drilling teams, and they tend to be led by Canadians. We have the best drillers in the world. But at the moment, all of the major research on deep hard rock drilling is being done outside this country. It's being done in the UK, in Slovakia, and in the United States. And they're starting to generate a lot of venture capital to do this. So just to give you an idea of what people are thinking of, Quay's Energy in the United States, which is pioneering a microwave process for blasting through very hard rock, wants to go down 20 kilometers, and it wants to be able to drop those wells in ex at the site of existing coal-fired power plants. You take out the boiler, put the wells in, drive the coal the, the uh, originally coal-fired turbine, and put the power right into the grid. You don't have to build new infrastructure. Eventually, you should be able, if you can do this properly, you should be able to drop the wells in the middle of a city. You don't have to have extended grids across the countryside. And in cold climates, you can use the heat directly for district heating. This is starting to explode around the world. And we've raised some money in the Cascade Institute to see how Canada can put itself in this technological space to pioneer, to, to, to develop the drilling technology. There are four major technological pathways, plasma, microwave, percussive, and water jet. Where can Canada find its role in there? So here's the, here's the short story on deep geothermal, and then we'll go on to the next section of this talk. The short story is this. Why do we build, why are we thinking about building all these little reactors all over the surface of the planet with the attendant proliferation problems, weapons proliferation and uh, hazardous wastes and stuff, when we can drill 10 kilometers to 15 kilometers under our feet and find thousands of times the power that all of humanity needs from the biggest and best shielded reactor on the planet, which is at the core of the Earth? To me, this is a no-brainer. And for some reason, it's like, you know, economists talk about $20 bills that are sitting on the sidewalk and nobody's reaching over to pick them up. Well, this is harder to pick up than the $20 bill. There's some serious technological challenges here and I could go on and on about it, but humankind has solved harder problems than this, way harder problems. We're pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into fusion that may help us 50 years from now. It's always 50 years in the future. This is potentially a source of, hu of huge power within 30, maybe even sooner. Okay, next slide. Powerful hope. And this, I think, will relate to some of the things that are happening within this community. So I talked about the material response. I want to say that there is a pathway. It almost certainly involves ultra-deep geothermal to really fundamentally solving our climate change problem and our carbon problem. Now I want to talk about dealing with the psychological impacts of these issues and having 
a vision of the future, a desirable future that will actually motivate us to keep going. Where is it that we want to go here? It's not just about having technology. It's not just about drilling a lot of wells. We also have to feel that we're creating and building a world that's going to be a good place to live in. Next slide. So at the end of Commanding Hope, I build my vision of the future around some principles. I don't paint a picture of particular technologies and institutions and stuff. I actually think you need to ground it in principles. Principles of security, opportunity, justice, and identity. People want to be safe. They want to feel they can flourish. They want to be fairly treated. And they want to feel that they're part of a community, a we, that is strong and will and will protect them, and that gives them a sense of moral orientation. Next slide. So this emerged in part from my thinking about the nature of human beings, and in particular, uh, what I call temperaments. And you've probably heard, you might have heard of the big five personality types, and there are all kinds of ways of categorizing human beings, but I actually find this to be very useful. And I sort of decided that when I looked at the research and I looked at people in the world around me, that you could sort of categorize people roughly by three temperaments, what I would call the exuberant, the prudent, and the empathetic. And you can see the dominant positive emotion of each, principal aspiration, aversions. Exuberant people are full of enthusiasm about life. They have this sense of opportunity. They want lots of elbow room for their agency, right? Uh, prudent people are sensitive to risk. They see dangers and warn of dangers. Empathetic people focus on the well-being of others in the community, fairness and justice. Now, it's not the case that we're all in one part of this triangle or another. We're all a mix of a bit of each. But there's a tendency, I think we'd all agree, that, that we can recognize people who sort of fall closer to one of the apexes of the triangle than another one. Next slide. And it's, there you see the principal aspirations reflected in the principles I just identified, right? So here's the thing. Our political system, the political ideologies, the dominant political ideologies out there tend to appeal to one or two or most of these temperaments rather than, than all three. You know, conservative political opportunities might appeal to opportunity and safety, opportunity in the market, the exuberance of entrepreneurship, right? The safety of security, building borders, keeping people out. Uh, people on the left of the, of the uh, political spectrum uh, may be more motivated by justice and fairness. If we want to build a vision of the future, it has, there has to be a place for everybody, all of these temperaments. It has to bring people together in a way that makes them all feel safe. This is really important. If you want to build your alliances to deal with a problem like climate change, alliances that are powerful, everybody has to see themselves in the picture of the future it presents. Okay? Next slide. Fourth principle, this idea of we. So this idea of uh, having a sense of community, uh, a, a sense of shared fate, common fate. Next slide. So in my research as a social scientist, I've noticed something. And I have to say, I don't generally adhere to the idea that there's a single variable that drives a lot of stuff. I'm a complexity guy. I see lots of complexity, lots of variables operating simultaneously. But if I were asked, is there one thing that determines the success of a society or not? And I've traveled in societies around the world, 60 of them, done extensive research in about a dozen. The one thing I've noticed is those societies that succeed in the sense that they solve their problems well, relatively well, have a strong sense of the common wheel. There's a strong commitment from the, from the elites all the way down to the bottom of the societies that, that, that everybody's in the, is in the project together, especially the elites. One of the things that's happening in the United States right now that's causing the society to fall apart is the elites are defecting. They're they, uh, many of them are saying, I don't care about the rest, about America or Americans. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm bailing on this. I'm building my gated community. I'm, you know, I've got my, my, uh, my place to bolt to in New Zealand. Uh, and, and when that happens, especially when elites defect, then 
then if societies won't solve their problems and you start to get institutional disintegration, social disintegration. Next slide. So we're in a situation though nowadays on this planet where it's a very palpable, obvious circumstance of shared fate. I'm almost done. Where am I in my time? It's okay. Um, next slide. This, and, and this is something, when I talk to Ben and Kate, this is what I emphasize. That we're in a circumstance on this planet that is completely unique, sui generis. Humankind has never experienced anything like this before. And I'm not a big believer in human nature. I think human nature is actually highly plastic. And, uh, and so we don't know what's going to happen under these very novel circumstances. It may be that we just end up fighting each other because it's a, a situation of increasing scarcity and everybody retreats into their narrow identity groups and gets ready to fight, right? Lots of war, civil violence, billions of people die. Or it may be that we're going to have a kind of flip, something very different. There's been a time in the past, it was called the Axial Age, between 600 BCE and 200 BCE, when there was a major transformation of human culture. Five different civilizations changed their fundamental character simultaneously, laid to the groundwork for modern, modern human civilization, modern notions of cosmology, of moral order, of political order. We may be on the cusp of a second axial age now, because we're in a really different situation. We have first, extraordinary connectivity in the planet. Let me give you a sense for just how extraordinary this is. It's like we don't even notice anymore. Between March 2020, middle of March 2020 and the middle of April 2020, four billion people on the planet locked down. There's never been such a significant change in the behavior of the species, of such a large fraction of species, of species so fast in its entire history. Never. I can guarantee that. Right? Four billion people locked down, and that was because of the connectivity in the system in terms of the information spreading. Between middle of March 2020 and the middle of April 2020, the concept of physical or social distancing went global. If you'd asked me in January 2020 what physical or social distancing meant, I would have said, well, I don't know. I think most of you would have too. But by the middle of April 2020, it was, it was all over the planet and it was changing people's behavior. Abundant scientific knowledge. Compared to, for instance, to the Black Death in the 14th century, we understand our problems. We may not be doing anything enough about them. We may not be getting to enough, but we understand the climate change problem. We understand what we need to do to solve it. We understand the zoonotic viral diseases and why they're emerging more frequently. In two days, in January 2020, I think it was January 2020, after the Chinese uploaded the viral sequence for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the RNA sequence, both Pfizer and Moderna had the morphology of their vaccines calculated, the basic shape of the vaccine molecule. Now, it took a significant period of time to do the testing and everything, but we still, I think it was, I, I need to check this figure, but I think within a year, we had the vaccines into almost half the world's population. Now, it wasn't fair. Rich people got at the front of the line like us, right? But unbelievable response in the context of human history that was made possible by our scientific knowledge, okay? So that's interesting. Stuff is happening here that we're not really recognizing. You know, people say the pandemic was a sorry story Kills probably killed by the end probably 30 million people uh, by the end of the story. By the time it's all tallied up and people get accurate statistics, you look at the death differentials within societies and stuff like that. Could easily have been 100 million. Without those changes in social behavior, the social distancing, the lockdowns, when before we had vaccines, the development of the vaccines. So enormous numbers of lives were saved all over the planet. Then this last thing, awareness of common fate. What we're getting right now is a rude lesson that there's nowhere to go, right? But this pandemic or the climate change, I get asked by folks. I get asked, uh, where can I go? I'm not asked so much anymore, right? Like, where can I go? Where can I go when climate change gets really bad? Where can I go when things start to fall apart? And I say, uh, nowhere. 
because the energy flux is changing over the entire planet. Hey, you think you go to New Zealand, people say, oh, go to New Zealand, be safe. New Zealand's going to burn too. Tasmania was burning. And oh, by the way, if things get really bad and you see, and this is probably one of the things that freaked out the students at the independent school, when you see, when you see the societies in the Asia Pacific Basin start to fall apart, hundreds of thousands of people will arrive on boats on the shores of New Zealand. There is nowhere to go. The people who are rich may be able to delay the inevitable for them and their families by a decade or two, but everybody's sliding down this slope together. Now that's, I don't think that's fully dawned on folks, but I think it's a conversation that's emerging. There's a contest in the world between division, motivated by fear and anger and people like Trump, and solidarity, motivated by this stuff. And it's probably the most important contest between, between emotional and ideational factors in the history of the species. It's not clear which way it's going to go. But as I said to the kids the other day, I said, you know, my act actuarially, I've got about another 20, 30, 25 years or something. And, you know, let's say 2025, 20, 2045 or so. And, you know, if I'm on my deathbed and still conscious, I'll say, damn, I really want to know how this is going to turn out. You know, it's an incredible time to be part of this challenge. We're either going to get through this and humankind is going to grow up or we're going to continue to live like adolescents, thinking we're immortal, not thinking about the future at all and trashing the place, which is basically the way we're behaving right now, or we're going to grow up and learn how to live on this planet together in a sensible way with a natural environment around us. And it's going to be a very changed natural environment, inevitably, because of what we've already done. Next slide. We need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. Will Stefan passed away just a few weeks ago. What a loss. One of the greatest Australian systems thinkers. Next slide, in climate science. You know, you recognize this person. She's world famous. If somebody on August 18th, 2018, had said a, a girl of 15 is going to sit on the steps of the Swedish Parliament building with a little sign saying school strike for climate and she was going to change the entire global conversation about climate change and mobilize hundreds of millions of people, we would have said, oh, that's silly. That's a stupid idea. That possibility was just beyond the boundary of what we thought was real in what complexity scientists call the adjacent possible. It was there. And Greta Thunberg connected some ideas together to make an absolutely compelling moral argument. She was saying to adults, you had one job. It was to take care of us. And you failed. And we're angry. And we want to do what we can to take back power. Now, it's idealistic, naive perhaps, but boy, did it ever change the conversation. And it was right there and we didn't know it was possible. Who knows what else is possible that's just in the adjacent possible waiting to be discovered. That's the other thing the Cascade Institute is about, is looking for those possibilities. Next slide. There's supposed to be one more. Next slide. That's it. So the last one, the, I, I thought I had a slide where somebody's holding up a sign saying, because time is running out. And it was in the middle. I have another one of a bunch of people protesting because time is running out. And uh, I think there's lots for us to do. The one thing I would say, and this, I said this to the students, but I think it's true for all of us of all ages. It doesn't matter what you're doing, where you are, what your profession is. There is stuff to do, right? Artist, carpenter, lawyer, accountant, scientist, engineer, uh, factory worker, their jobs of an infinite variety in responding to these challenges. And that makes it an interesting time too. But the one thing we have to accept is that it's, it's going to be very volatile and it's going to be really scary. And we're going to have to constantly push back against that sense of despair and fear by having our own uh, internal reservoir of, I guess I would call it commanding hope. Thank you. You have a meeting, don't you? You have a meeting that you have to convene. What's the time now? It's about 8.05 or something, 8.10? 8.13. 8.13? I have a...
car that's going to pick me up in a, in a in just a few minutes. But I can take a few comments and questions if if, if that's of interest, or is it too late? Oh, okay. Oh, I can't. Uh, well, that, uh, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> That's wonderful. That's so terrific. Okay. Oh, so, so I'm drawing for the gift basket. That isn't. That's me. That's. Uh, okay. Uh, you all should have gotten a, a ticket um, on the way in the door, and we have the duplicate of that ticket here, and we're going to ask Mr. Homer Dixon to figure out who's going to get the mystery plot prize. I didn't have a ticket. Yeah, you don't need this prize. <laughs> okay, we're looking for the last four numbers. 2119. <laughs> It's your book. <laughs> um, or a box of chocolates. Who knows? <laughs> but you can share regardless. Yeah, Great. And Tad, on behalf of the APRM and everyone in Chosen, we just really oh, wow! Look at that. Coming. Uh, a whole bunch of uh, goodies, a lot of stuff uh, that are. Isn't available. that great? And um, I think you've inspired a lot of us. Socks. I can, I can take those to Ottawa. That's excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, we've got a new council, and I think you've just stressed, um, you know, bringing this community together and really working together as a community and just really working together. I think that's my takeaway. Uh, yeah. And I think hopefully everyone here is taking that away too. Great. Right Thank now. you so much. Thank you. Great. So what should we do? I wonder if I could pick it up later. It's okay. Yes. I, I'm yeah. now being broadcast in the entire world. Uh, yes. I guess it could be dropped off at the house. Yeah. Werner, yeah, that would be great. Should we, should we, do people want to have a little conversation for a few minutes? Um, I think the fellow who's taking me to the airport will, I might just have to send him a note in a second and then he'll wait. Their hands up all over the place. Can we do that, or what's your time? Yeah. Okay. So let's go here. Yes. I'm listening. I'm just sending a note to so it doesn't go away and I don't get to the airport. Okay. So keep going. So Let me address both of the great points, okay? So let's, I'll start with the latter one. There is an extended section on growth in Commanding Hope. It, it's just, this is purely a function of what I decide to talk about. Um, I say it's the most difficult problem that we have. We need it, but it's killing us. We need it because half the people on the planet are still living in, ex in extreme poverty, and they expect growth because they want to kind of live like us. They need to... They need to leapfrog technologically where we are and what we've done, because as you point out, we've done most of the damage up to this point, by far the majority of damage. Uh, uh, but you know, if India, for instance, replicates our development pathway with fossil fuels, that's it, right? So, but they want to grow. It's not, it's not an option to take growth off the table for half or two thirds of the world's population. Uh, there is an inescapable, and I think this is where you're going. It's part, by the way, in the section of the book where I talk about justice 
It's right there, very explicit. There is an inescapable question of redistribution at the global level. Um, on the other hand, and I've been struggling with the issue of growth ever since I ran the World Three Limits to Growth models at UVic before I went out east back in the 1970s. The, one of the reasons I'm emphasizing energy is we cannot sustain 10 billion on people on this planet without, uh, without massive continued economic activity. We can't just, we live in this kind of isolated bubble in Machosen. This is not realistic. You just have to go a few kilometers to see see the pressures that are developing, right? So uh, without huge inputs of zero carbon energy, there will be major wars that will kill billions of people, okay? So we're in a, an extraordinarily difficult situation here, and I sometimes think that the, the, the degrowth people and the anti-growth people who I know and I've worked with and I've studied their stuff are not fully realistic about the futures that they're proposing. But I also don't fully understand what the alternatives are. But I do know that one thing, again, I talk about necessary conditions, sine qua nons, one thing that we have to have if we're going to pull out of this nosedive is massive amounts of high power density, zero carbon energy. And the only place I can see that coming from is down there. Okay, so that's one reason I'm focusing on that. It's, I know that has to be part of the story, whether it's in India or Africa or Indonesia or Canada, it has to be part of the story. Now, how we're gonna restructure the global economy so it's more fair and so that we reduce our material stress on the global environment is an, an extraordinarily difficult challenge that's not being addressed effectively because the rest of the world, you go to the World Economic Forum, they're locked into a neoliberal uh, economic mindset where conventional notions of growth are just aren't challenged. And that's, and that's not, uh, and that's not going to get us to the right place. Now, I know you're not f completely satisfied, but take a, take a look at the parts in my book where I have, a, I have about 20 pages in my book where I talk about the issue of growth. And I think you would find that you agree with most of what I say in there. Woof, over here, yeah. The, the large sort of normative synthesis, I think, yes, there are people who are trying to pull these threads together. And, I, and this isn't really the place where I work, so I, I'm not going to rattle off a bunch of names. But I think, I think it's, an, it, it's underdeveloped, in part because the, the technical problems that, that are underlie all of this are still unsolved. Like, people want to live better, but the process of generating the material wealth that allows them to live better is killing us at the same time now that we've got 10 billion, approaching 10 billion people on the planet. Yeah, okay, so I see where you're going. So I think whatever is, whatever's pathway in terms of worldviews we're going to adopt as we move into through this century. So something like a second axial age where we have a shift of the, of a, in, in humankind's sense of its place in, 
in the universe and its moral order and stuff like that. It will involve what, what I would call deep relationalism, which is a sense of connectivity uh, that people will feel connected not just to their communities, but connected to nature in a way that is often reflected in indigenous philosophies. So, so this sense that we are all part of, a, of systems that, that uh, are not, not just connected together, but that have damaged in part cause damage elsewhere in the system, right? I, I'm gonna have to turn some other folks. I'm gonna take two more, okay? Werner, yes. Thanks, Ned, for a great presentation. Um, one scientific visual explanation and bringing it back to the children. First, when Matt and the scientific community talk about 1.5, we need to understand that what we're talking about is a global average surface temperature. I will see the Earth in motion, and motions have a huge resistance. When you look at what's already happening, not projections, what's already happening, we have temperature increases in the winter in Canada and other regions in the north of 4 and 5 degrees centigrade. Not peak temperature on one day, mean monthly or quarterly temperature increases of 4 to 5 degrees with 1.2 so what that means for us and everything else that Pat said is that you know we need to think beyond mitigation, we also need to start thinking about adaptation. It's inevitable. And for Mitch for Mitchelson, what I think it means, the single biggest threat that I see when I I mean I am Pat's neighbor we live next to each other. <laughs> we have lovely conversations. <laughs> Same view of the ocean, the ocean the world. Um, the biggest threat I see for Mitchelson is fire. Yes. And we think that we live, you know, in the wet part of British Columbia. In the September Labor Day wildfires in 2020 in Oregon, west of the Cascades, an area that everybody says doesn't burn, it's wet forest like in the In just a few days, they burned more area than the previous 50 years combined. 50 years worth of fires in just a few days on the west side of Oregon. We are not in to that. We are just a few hundred kilometers away. We're just lucky in terms of that the, the way the air flows when we face big on all the dry stuff. So here in the Chelsea, we really need to look around us. We need to look at the fuel that we have as a result of a century of fire suppression and war, and ask ourselves, what would we do if that fire on Lincoln Park Mountain or, or that fire on Long Street Road that they managed to put out? What if one of those type, uh, fires is on a hot August day when we have 30, 40, 50 kilometer winds from the west? And what will happen in that global in the yeah. So we yeah. see it all over the world, and we think that we're immune to it or not. Yeah, and I think I had somebody say the other day to me, well, you know, these forests don't burn. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Berner. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I, I'm over here, and then I'm afraid that's going to have to be. And because. No. Oh, I do. I have seen this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> well, okay, so let me talk about World 3, okay, because I actually, before I left for Ontario, to Carleton University in Ontario, I did two years of UVic, and I actually, I, I, I was, took computer science, and I was really fascinated. In those days, there was a big mainframe computer in the bottom, of, I think, of the Clarehue building, and, uh, you know, we had to work, work with punch cards, and I was fascinated by this technology, so I sent off for the World 3 model, and it arrived in a box, it was about 90 or 100, 900 punch cards, a big box, 900 or 1,000 punch cards. So I studied the World 3 model. The World 3 model hasn't actually changed very much, okay? They got something approximating what I, approximating what I think is probably a reasonably accurate answer, but there are all kinds of mistakes inside. And the fundamental one is that they thought the real problem that was going to debilitate human economies was shortages of non-renewable resources, oil, copper, and the like. And they thought because the renewable resources, cropland, forests, and et cetera, are renewable, 
that they were actually uh, more abundant and would remain more abundant than the non-renewable resources. It turns out it's almost exactly the reverse. The, re non, the non-renewable resources like petroleum and iron ore and copper, if you, we have enough energy, we just dig up enough dirt to find lower and lower quality materials. That's what we're doing with bitumen in Alberta. The renewable resources are complex systems. They're, they're ecological systems. They involve life usually. And it's when you start pulling pieces out by damaging them or stressing them enormously by, by changing, for instance, the temperature uh, on the surface of the planet dramatically, then those systems can flip into a different state. They can actually break down. So it turns out the real scarcity of resources on the planet is the renewable resources, not the non-renewable resources. So the limits to growth folks got it exactly backwards. And, and that means I think these models actually aren't terribly helpful. The, your more general question is, uh, are we looking at collapse? And where do you find hope in that? And the answer is, yeah, perhaps. And I guess I find hope in imagining how we can avoid it and find a pathway by it that doesn't produce collapse. So I have a colleague working for the Cascade Institute who's in Montreal right now at the International Studies Association Conference, and he's presenting a paper on societal collapse, synthesizing various theories of societal collapse and trying to understand where they're right, when they're wrong, and trying to put them together in a way that makes more sense. Um, but I know Mike, who's leading our polycrisis project, is doing that in part because he desperately wants to make, to see if there's a pathway for avoiding it, okay? Like the, my second book, The Upside of Down, was all about the collapse of Rome. This is not a happy scenario. It involves profound decomplexification of societies. You know, if Vancouver Island can't feed itself, if there's a food shock in the world and there's not enough food on this island, it takes about three or four days before people start rioting and trashing, trashing the grocery stores and stuff. And where do you think they're gonna come? So we have to do what we can to avoid these outcomes. There are a lot of people out there who think, oh, you know, collapse, that would be a good thing. I think it would be hideous. So, uh, so my hope is in finding a pathway that avoids that kind of outcome. I th and I think, and here's the last thing I'll say. When I talk, I, did, I had this conversation with Ben not long ago. This was during the summer, September, smoke everywhere. We were at Royal Roads. We went and sat on a, just next to the lagoon on a walkout carping, looking across at the Olympic Mountains, which we couldn't see because they were all shrouded in smoke. And, and you know, he's struggling with trying to figure out where his position is in this world. And I said, here's the thing. This world is too complex for us to know that it's a game over. There are so many things that could happen that we can't even imagine, and some of them might be amazing. And we just developed this technology, or just this technology system, or chat GPT, large language model AI, just came out of the woodwork. It's been in development for a long time, of course, but just sort of hit the headlines last November or so. And it's changed everything, not necessarily for the better. In four months, universities are rewriting their, their exam codes, and journalists are trying to figure out how they're going to respond to it. And it's just... it's. Who knows where we're going to be in six months' time? And some of those things are inevitably going to be good breaks, not just bad breaks. And we have to be ready to exploit them when they happen. So that's where I see it's in that uncertainty and the complexity of the future where I see that we might be able to start figuring out how to solve what appear to be profoundly intractable problems of growth and degrowth at this point. Because I, I don't see the answers there. But you keep poking at that adjacent possible, seeing where things might, where there might be breakthrough possibilities. And, uh, and there will be stuff that comes out, inevitably, because we don't know it all. The world's too complex. Anyway, thank you so much.